and we are going to do it to discuss about the lecture and very important interesting lecture about the motor system so uh, for our third year student it is very important uh, to uh, do the motor system examination and listen this one how we will examine a newborn yeah how we will examine the child so for the motor system first of all you introduce yourself to the patient and ask the permission from attendant whether it's mother or father and uh, after that you expose properly the patient and you will do the inspection and listen the command of your uh, doctor carefully and uh, what are the command if they are asking you about check the power you do only check the power okay if they ask about the reflexes you do the reflex of the patient but being a doctor you must know how we will examine a motor system so always compare the both sides expose properly compare both sides and if they come on for the reflexes you try to check the right and left both upper limb or lower limb whatever the command you should compare both sides don't do the examination on only one side okay so the examination examine the following and compare two sides note any abnormality and its location on inspection you should check the bulk and nutrition tone of the muscles and power of the muscles reflexes coordination of the movements involuntary movements and gait so these are the main component of the motor system we will discuss each one by one so for the bulk and the nutrition of the muscles expose the limbs and compare corresponding parts of the both sides the muscle of the dominant limb have little more bulk than non dominant limb it may be decreased in wasting atrophy or disuse when a person can't for perform any function are increased in in case of the hypertrophy and wasting usually the bilateral symmetrical wasting is difficult to pick until it is fairly advanced while unilateral localized wasting is clearly detected the wasted muscles are small soft and floppy the wasting is a feature of lower motor neuron lens so if you found the wasting you should explain to your examiner and what is the hypertrophy in true hypertrophy both muscle bulk and power are increased it occurs in response to excessive use of muscles as in bodybuilder and athletics it can also occur in myotonic disorders so uh, if you would like to see the hypertrophic muscles the bulk mass will be increased if you want to check this uh, in bodybuilders their bicep and their pectoral muscles are prominent as compared to the normal due to the exercise and fasciculations these are the involuntary contraction of group of muscles and fiber innervated by a single motor neuron and appears as a fine so these are the fasciculations bulk you will do on the inspection then check for the tone and tone is defined as the resistance felt when joint is moved passively patient cooperation and relaxation are necessary for proper assessment of the tone patient should lie supine and be relaxed and comfortable tone may be increased and it is known as hypertonia or tone may be decreased which is known as hypotonia hypertonia there are two types of the hypertonia one is spasticity and other is rigidity how we will differentiate we will differentiate in spasticity the resistance rapidly increases during first few degree of passive movement then movement continues it suddenly decreases it resembles it resembles opening or closure of the clasp knife and is also called clasp knife spasticity it occurs in upper motor neuron lens and rigidity there is uniform sustained resistance throughout the range of passive movement this resembles bending of a lead pipe and is also called lead pipe rigidity it is a 
it occurs in the region of basal ganglion. So spasticity is a feature of upper motor neuron. One upper, one upper and one lower limbs. Uncrossed hemiplegia, cranial nerve involved on the same side and weakness of also on the same side. Crossed hemiplegia, the cranial nerves. Hmm. 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 So uncrossed hemiplegia, cranial nerve involvement and hemiplegia on the same side. Crossed hemiplegia is defined as cranial nerves are involved on the one side and hemiplegia is on the opposite side. Monoplegia is different uh, weakness of the one limb. Paraplegia is weakness of both lower limbs. Diplegia is defined as weakness of both upper limb. Quadriplegia, weakness of all four limbs. So hemiplegia, same side weakness of upper and lower limb, uncrossed cranial nerve involvement and hemiplegia on the same side. Crossed hemiplegia is defined as cranial nerve involvement on the one side and hemiplegia is on the opposite side. Monoplegia, the weakness of one limb, paraplegia, weakness of both lower limb, diplegia, weakness of both upper limb and quadriplegia, weakness of all four limbs. So whenever you notice the weakness, whether in the upper limb or lower limb, you should define as that is weakness in the upper limb. If both upper limbs are weak, you should label as patient is having diplegic weakness. Okay, and quadriplegia means the weakness in the all four limbs, means of both upper and lower limbs involved. So grading of power is so grading of power. Uh, you should check from zero grade up to the five. Mm -hmm. Grade zero power means the complete paralysis. No filter movements, nothing else. Patient's lying flat and and no uh, movement in the limb. Grade one power is uh, defined as filter of the contraction only. And grade two, patient can move his limbs when gravity is excluded, moving limbs horizontally on the bed, but not against the gravity. And grade three, patient can move against gravity, can lift the limb of the bed, but not against the resistance. Grade four, patient can move against resistance, but power is less than normal. And grade five is normal power. So someone asked you a question, what is the grade three power? You should label as a patient can move against gravity, but not against resistance. Uh, so you should must remember and memorize all five grade. Grade five means normal power, okay? So grades are power from grade zero up to five. Five power is a normal. And upper limbs, In upper limbs, you should check the small muscles of the hands. All small muscles of hand are supplied by T1 spinal segments. The abductor pollicis brevis, it is supplied by the median nerve. Ask the patient to abduct thumb at the right angle to the palm against resistance. You check the power of the muscles of the abductor pollicis brevis. These are the small muscles which mostly we will do perform in the adults and pediatrics. You have a um, major commands not for the small muscles but being a doctor you must know all these things and opinion policies muscles and uh, you should check the power in this muscles it is supplied by the median nerve ask the patient to touch the little finger with the thumb and try to separate them with your index finger uh, abductor policies previous it is supplied by the ulnar nerve ask the patient to abduct, abduct the thumb towards the palmar surface of index finger against resistance you have to check the adductor policies brevis and lumbrical muscles first and second lumbricals are supplied by the median nerve while the third and fourth supplied by the ulnar nerve 
ask the patient to flex the metacarpophalangeal joints and extend at the interphalangeal joint against the resistance to check the lumbrical muscle, the power of the lumbrical muscles. So the first, second lumbrical are supplied by the median, third, fourth is supplied by the ulnar nerve. Flexure of the fingers, override your index finger and middle fingers and ask the patient to squeeze them. You pull to free them to check the flexure of the fingers. Same, the extensor of the fingers, ask the patient to open the fist against resistance to check the extensor of the fingers. And flexure of the wrist, ask the patient to bring tip of his finger towards the in front of the forearm against the resistance. And for the extension of the wrist, ask the patient to make a fist involved in firm contraction of the flexion and extension at the wrist. Now try to flex the fist against the resistant. It there is another method. Ask the patient to grasp something firmly in his hand. If extensor are weak, the wrist is flexed. And uh, break your radials. Ask the patient to flex the elbow against resistant while arm is in midway semi-prone position. Bicep, ask the patient to flex the elbow against resistance while arm is fully supinated. And tricep, it is the extensor muscles of the uh, elbow. Ask the patient to stretch the uh, flexed forearm against the resistance to check the muscle of extensor compartment, that is the tricep. And in the lower limbs, if you want to check the power of the toes, power of the ankle, it's also important how we will perform this, how we will check the power. The dorsiflexion of the toe, ask the patient to move the toe upward against resistance. The dorsiflexion of the foot, ask the patient to move the foot upward against the resistance and the plantar flexion of the toe, ask the patient to move the toe downwards against resistance and the plantar flexion of the foot ask the patient to move the foot downwards against resistance so you should check the power of the flexor and the extensor compartment of the toes and foot simultaneously you would check the flexor and extensor of the knee for the extensor of the knees bend the knee against Ask the, ask the patient to straight it against the resistance. And uh, for the flexion of the knee, raise the leg up from the bed, support the thigh with the left hand and hold the ankle with the right hand. Then ask the patient to bend the knee against resistance. And uh, for the hip, So uh, you have to check the extensor compartments of the knee, the flexor compartment of the knee, and extensor of the hip, flexor of the hip, adductor of the hip, and abductor of the thigh. Place the patient's leg together and ask him to separate them against the resistance. And for the muscle of the trunk, to test the muscle of abdominal wall, ask the patient to lift his head up from pillow against resistant. Abdominal muscles can be failed to contract. If muscles of lower limbs are paralyzed, the umbilical move upward and vice versa. This is called B-war sign. So basically the B-war sign for the uh, power of muscle of the trunk, okay? and reflexes. This is a very important topic uh, uh, for your examination per, uh, point of view, uh, where you can differentiate whether it is upper motor neuron lien or lower motor neuron lens, uh, what are the normal reflexes, what are the exaggerated reflexes, what, is the, what are the causes of the diminished or absent reflexes. So uh, these depends on the reflexes, uh, uh, which consists of an afferent limbs and an afferent limb. The afferent limb known as sensory transmit through the impulse generated by stimulation of the receptors to the communicating neurons. 
which in turn send stimulus to the efferent organs uh, that the muscle through the efferent motor limbs. The whole reflex uh, should be intact for the reflex to be elicited. Each reflex is carried out by one or two spinal segments, which is called root value of that reflexes. It should be remembered reflexes are of two types, deep tendon reflexes, are deep reflexes and superficial reflexes and like the tendon reflexes we can say the ankle bicep tricep breaker radials and for superficials like remestric anal abdominal and conjunctival reflexes so if you have a uh, command for the superficial reflexes you should do the corneal conjunctival abdominal anal remestric reflexes if you have a command for deep uh, reflexes it means that tendon you should check for the tendon jerk whether it's the knee jerk ankle uh, bicep tricep or brachioradials you should follow the command so the uh, an uh, ankle jerks uh, the root value of is ankle jerk uh, s1 s2 the knee jerk l3 l4 bicep jerk c5 c6 brachioradial c5 c6 tricep jerk uh, c6 and c7 plantar reflex s1 Abdominal reflex T8 to T12, cremestrical reflexes L1, L2, anal reflex L3, S3, S4, conjunctival and carnal reflexes is cranial nerve 5 and 7. You must remember the root value as well. So the reflexes, uh, as I have told you about that, ankle, knee, bicep, tricep, brachioradials. These are the deep reflexes. And what is the reinforcement for the reflexes of lower limb? Ask the patient to clench hands and hook the fingers of both hands together and then pull them away from the each other without disengaging. For reflex of upper limbs, ask the patient to clench the teeth. This phenomenon of reinforcement lasts only for less than a second. So the bicep and look at the methods how we will check the bicep reflexes. Flex the elbow at right angle and place the forearm in semi pronated position. Place the thumb and index finger of your left hand over the tendon of the bicep in cubital fossa and strike it with the hammer. For the tricep reflexes, place the forearm on the patient's abdomen, elbow being flexed at the right angle strike the tendon of the tricep above the olecranon see the contraction of the tricep S simultaneously if you want to check the brachioradials uh, this is also called supinator jerk flex the forearm at elbow and place it in semi pronated position bend the hand slightly towards ulnar side strike the tendon of the brachioradials pro proximal to steroid process of the radius see the contraction of the brachioradials. For the ankle jerk, patient should lie supine, flex the leg slightly and place it in on the external rotated position. Darcy flex the foot with the left hand and strike the Achilles tendon with the hammer. See the contraction of the calf muscles. For the knee, patient should lie supine Flex the knee and support it with your left hand. Feel for the tendon of the quadricep and strike it between the patella and tibial tuberosity with a hammer. With a hammer, see contraction of the quadriceps. So the landmark is between the tibial tuberosity and patella. So you feel the tendon and you strike uh, over there and see the uh, uh, reflexes at the quadricep. For the clonus, it is this is an involuntary oscillatory muscular contraction and relaxation involved by the stretching of the muscles. And there are two types of clonus. One is the ankle clonus, and other is the patellar clonus. What are the interpretation of the reflexes? This is very important. So the reflexes are increased, tendon reflexes are increased in case of the upper motor neuron lesions. And diminished tendon reflex, the reflexes are diminished or absent. In, if in the case of lower motor neuron lesions, and uh, if you want to see the superficial, superficial reflexes, these are the plantar, abdominal, cremestric, anal, conjunctival, and corneal reflexes. 
Now we will check this for the plantar. Normal response is plantar flexion of the grade two along with the flexion induction of the toes. This is called as negative Babinski sign. If there is an extension or dorsiflexion of the grade toe, usually accompanied by feigning of the other toe, this is called up upgoing plantars or extensor plantars are positive Babinski sign. And it is a sign of the upper motor neuron lions. So positive Babinski sign means the upper motor neuron lions. And uh, we will check by two other method as well. So what are the causes of plantar upgoings? Number one, upper motor neuron lions. Number two, hypoglycemia. Number three, deep coma. Number four, epileptic, post-epileptic fades. Number five, below the age of one year. So less, uh, the, uh, and if a kid is in less than one year, the plantar is usually upgoing. And if patient is in comatose, a patient having epileptic fads, and you examine after the epileptic fads, patient having a poor motor plantar upgoing. And I, in the case of hypoglycemia as well, our most common cause is upper motor neuron lion. Of opinion signs, extensor plantar response elicited by the rubbing over the crest of the tibia. And Gordoner reflex, extensor plantar reflex is elicited by the pin, pinching the Achilles tendon. So you should check the plantar reflexes by three methods. Okay, one is Babinski sign, other is opinion signs, and third is the Gordon signs. Both these signs, the opinion signs and Gordoner's reflexes, both these signs are present when cartricospinal lien is widespread and severe. Hoffman signs. Hold the terminal phalanges of the patient's middle finger between your thumb and index finger. Flex it at terminal interphalangeal joint and uh, then flick it into extension with your thumb. If sign is positive, there is quick flexion of the patient's thumb. It, it is a hyperreflexia. If unilateral positive, it is strongly suggestive of upper motor neuron lions. It should not be confused with Hohmann signs. That is a sign for the deep venous thrombosis. So this is a Hoffman signs. And finger flexion jerk. Place the tip of your middle and index finger across the palmar surface of the proximal phalanges of the patient. Then lightly tape your own fingers. A slight flexion of the patient's finger is normal, but a brisk contraction suggestive hyperreflexia. And other methods to check the reflexes, the one of the Ros Rosolimo signs, flex the distal, distal phalange of the toe into extension with your fingers and then allow them to fall back into normal position. A positive response is brisk plantar reflex of grade two. This is sign of pathological hyperreflexia. It is a counterpart of the Hoffman signs. It is particularly helpful when plantar reflex cannot be elicited or cannot be obtained by, because of the paralysis of the extensor helices longus. Absent plantar reflex, sometimes no plantar uh, response is obtained with the usual stimulus. One of the following could be the reason. Coldness of the feet, sensory loss over S1 segments, the paralysis of the muscle of the great toe, spinal shock due to the transaction of the spinal cord. Superficial reflexes, abdominal reflexes, the patient should be warm and relaxed, lying in supine position with a low pillow supporting the head, drop in from the lateral part of the abdomen towards the midline on either sides. And cremastic reflex is scratch the inner aspect of the upper part of the thigh. Normally, there is an elevation of the testis. This reflex in upper motor neuron lions. And the anal reflex is to check the anal reflexes, scratch the skin near the anal margin with a sharp object. There is a contraction of the anal inspector. And now, one important component of the motor system is to check the coordination. In upper limb, you should check the finger, nose test, 
finger to finger test in the lower limb heel knee test and heel toe test for the gait and certain involuntary movements if you notice in a patient the tremors these are the rhythmic involuntary movements resulting from alternating contraction and relaxation of the group of muscles these involve the peripheral part of the bodies like hand head tongue and what are the causes of the tremors the causes mostly the anxiety thyrotoxicosis the essential familial tremors the senile tremors so these are the causes of the tremors and parkinsonian tremors parkinsonian is basically disease of old age it is not present in the children but being a doctor you must know about the type of tremors which tremors present in the parkinsonism these are the slow and coarse typically they are pill rolling movements of the thumb tremors are partially suppressed during voluntary movements and disappear during sleep other feature of parkinsonism is the rigidity hypokinesia and what are the intentional tremors ask the patient to catch the object say a pencil held in your hand tremors are absent at rest become prominent as patient approach the object and disappear thereafter so intentional tremors are the feature of the cerebellar dysfunction flipping tremors it is uh, ask the patient to outstretch uh, out stretch arms and dorsiflex hand at wrist jerky movements of the hand occurs due to the flexion and extension of the wrist and fingers causes of flipping tremors are respiratory renal hepatic and cardiac failure mostly we will check this in the uh, liver failure the flipping tremors athetoid movements so there are certain other movements abnormal movements if you notice you should you should label that these are the type of the different movements say for example one movement is a chorea chorea is a greek word it means the dancing so the dance is a every step should be new so the chorea is a different abnormal movements but the every step is new and athetoid movements these are the slow writhing movements principally affect the distal parts of the limbs combination of the choreoform and athetoid movements may occur in the same patients and that is known as a choreoathetoid movements what are the myoclonus these are the sudden like contraction that involve one or more muscles or the whole limb these sometime occurs in normal people when falling asleep and it is also a feature of the epilepsy that's known as a myoclonus epilepsy and dystonic movements these are the similar to athetoid movements but in involve proximal parts they are, are turning or twisting movements of the limb or trunk sustained abnormal contraction and limb posturing spasmodic torticollis and dystonia musculorum deformants are the example of the dystonic movements so the dystonia involve mostly the proximal muscles okay and a thyroid movements involve the distal limbs distal uh, part of the limb and check the gait gait of the patient is important to differentiate to rule out what are the causes of the abnormal gaits like a, a, if a baby having congenital hip dislocation how you will diagnose from the gait if patients having a, a cerebellar dysfunctions what are the gait in the myopolyneuropathy what type of the gaits in parkinsonism what are the type of the and gaits so first we check for the upper motor neuron paraplegia that is known as spastic gait this is seen in upper motor neuron paraplegia patient does not lift his feet from the ground completely so that does remain in contact with the ground the leg swing forwards and outwards in a circular fashion the hemiplegic gait is a spastic gait in which only one leg is affected high stepping gait this is seen in patients with bilateral foot drop as a result of weakness of extensor of the feet as in polyneuropathy patient lift the foot 
high to clear the toe from the ground and then return it with a loud slapping noise. That's known as a high stepping gait. And drunken gait, a patient walk on a broad base in a reeling manner. This occurs in cerebellar lesions. In unilateral lesions, the patients tend to stagger towards the affected side. Waddling gait. The body sway from side to side as each step is taken. This occurs in a proximal muscle weakness as in myopathies. And this is also a feature of the congenital dislocation of the hip. So the waddling gait is a, uh, it occurs in a congenital dislocation of the hip. Parkinsonian gait. It is characterized by forward with flexion at the hip and knee, arm are flexed at the elbow and adduct at the shoulder. There are no associated movements during walking. Walking is initiated slowly with short rapid steps, feet dragging or, slightly, or sliding along the floor, shuffling it uh, as the patient's body gradually lean further ahead of the feet. The pace tends to accelerate in an attempt to maintain an upright posture. So that's known as a fascinated gait. And typically the Parkinson, if you um, supposed to be an OPD, adult OPD of the medicine, you will easily see the patient of Parkinson and how they walk and particularly gait, you will be able to diagnose a Parkinsonism patient. Okay, so these are, are the different type of the gait. So once again, little review for the motor system. First, first introduce yourself, expose the patient properly, take permission from the attendant, compare the both sides, and what command is given to you, you should perform perfectly. You should have a hammer, what other medical equipment you must be at the bad sides. And if you have a command of the power, check the power of the upper limbs, lower limbs. Okay, if the uh, you have a command for the tone, you should check the tone. For the reflexes, you have to check the reflexes, compare on the both sides and uh, your method should be correct. You should be polite with the patient and make a practice during these uh, days. If you are supposed to have an opportunity in the wards and OPD, you should perform these examination more frequently because from third year onwards, you have clinical classes. You should uh, go on the beds and perform these examination. I make a small group of two to three students and perform the examination. And if you have any problem query, you should ask from your teacher and your method should be appropriate. And uh, this all happens when you will be able, you will perform more practices, okay? And uh, in the end, I will show a little video how to check the reflexes the, in the mm, little children, okay? So we will play the video. And thank you very much for listening the uh, lecture that's about the motor system. I uh, play the video. This guy has been doing the nail, right? Neurologic exam for some of the other neuro residents um, and wanted to capture a couple of different age groups and a couple of different parts of the exams mm -hmm. and things that kids are and are and are not able to do at different ages. So. 
So today we're going to go through um, some of the um, things that you wouldn't do in an adult patient that are useful to look at in a pediatric patient. Um, we'll start with um, looking at some of the things on the newborn exam. Um, so one of the things we usually assess is um, the infant's tone. Um, so uh, Carrie is going to start by doing a test for head lag. And a normal baby, um, you'll see that Millie actually holds her neck up quite ne quite nicely there. Um, in babies with hypotonia, you'll actually see the head kind of lag a little bit um, in the ventral position. And as you can see, Millie is holding her neck up quite nicely. In a baby with hypotonia, you would see that her arms and her um, legs and neck would um, kind of droop over and fall straight down towards the uh, and so what you do in this exam is put your hands um, ba basically under the baby's axilla. Um, and in a baby with low tone, you would see that the baby's arms would sort of start to go up towards the ceiling and the baby might actually uh -huh. slip through. The first one of the other reflexes we'll demonstrate is the rooting reflex. And so Carrie's just going to stroke right next to Millie's uh, mouth there. Um, and what you typically see in a newborn baby um, is that um, the baby will turn its head towards the side of the... Uh, um, so um, Carrie will next check the grasp reflex, which does tend to extinguish by the time um, an infant is around Millie's age, um, so around three or four months. A useful maneuver if you want um, to get the baby to open its fist up um, so that you can actually check this reflex is to kind of stroke along the side of the hand here. And we can actually demonstrate the plantar grasp reflex as well. An upgoing or extensor toe response can be normal um, in babies up to the age of about a year. And um, as we're going to demonstrate the more uh, reflex, which basically is where you uh, Close it, um, the infant's arms will extend way out, um, sometimes out forward and sometimes out to the sides. Uh, that reflex typically extinguishes around three to six months of age. Um, and so it's important to check and make sure that that's um, symmetric. So next we wanted to demonstrate some physical exam findings that uh, you might want to elicit or observe in a two-year-old. Um, we thought we would start with kind of mental status or development, kind of normal um, interactions that a two-year-old would have. Um, so um, in general, for language development in a two-year-old, you would expect them to start saying two-word sentences and have up to 50 words, but this can be very variable, what you see in clinic. You can get a, kind of get a sense from the parents about uh, how they think that their language is developing. 50% of speech should be intelligible by an unrelated adult at this point. Uh, where's the giraffe's nose? Right there. Where's his ears at? Right there. It's a pretty fun thing, huh? So here we can also use observation and toys to um, test things like fine motor and coordination. Uh, Can you draw a circle? So see, she draws a circle very nicely. She can mimic. Okay, she I'm going to draw a straight line. See, it's a straight line. Can you draw a straight line? Good job. Can you show me your tongue? Ah. Good job. Can you close your mouth? Mm. Can you open it? Ah. Can you close your eyes real tight? Real tight. Good job. Can you jump? Good job. Can you jump one more time? Jump. All right. So for an almost five-year-old, most of the things that you want to do on your neurologic exam are going to be the same as what you would do in an adult. Um, so we thought we could demonstrate some strength sure. testing. Okay. Like your Let's make some muscles up like this. Put your arms up way high like this. Put your elbows up. Put your elbows up. You keep them right there. Don't let me push them down. Don't let me push them down. As hard as you can. Good. Pizza box. You want to keep your hands real flat like this. And you don't want to drop that pizza, okay? You don't want to drop the pizza. Okay, close your eyes and keep holding that box straight up. Keep holding it right there. Keep holding it. Why don't you start over here and walk over and walk over to my friend Carrie over there on your tiptoes. Good job. Good job. Now go. 
asking you more facts than you on your heels. Woo! Good job. Three, four, <laughs> <laughs> Extra tricky. Awesome. There we go. and the reflexes and all these things. All right, I'm Carrie Neville. And I'm Robin Cook. We are the pediatric neurology residents. Uh, uh, yeah, currently second year residents, going to be third year, but really PGY two neuro people. Two would be three. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Um, so we thought that for our video, we could go over some highlights of the pediatric neurologic exam for some of the other neuro residents. Um, and wanted to capture a couple of different age groups and a couple of different parts of the exams. Mm -hmm. And things that kids are and are and are not able to do at different ages. So today we're going to go through um, some of the um, things that you wouldn't do in an adult patient that are useful to look at in a pediatric patient. Um, and we'll start with um, looking at some of the things on the newborn exam. Um, so one of the things we usually assess is um, the infant's tone. Um, so uh, Carrie is going to start by doing a test for head lag. And a normal baby, um, you'll see that Millie actually holds her neck up quite, ne quite nicely there. Um, in babies with hypotonia, you'll actually see the head kind of lag a little bit uh, in the ventral position. And as you can see, Millie is holding her neck up quite nicely. In a baby with hypotonia, you would see that her arms and her um, legs and neck would um, kind of droop over and fall straight down towards the... Uh, and so what you do in this exam is put your hands um, ba basically under the baby's axilla. Um, and in a baby with low tone, you would see that the baby's arms would sort of start to go up towards the ceiling and the baby might actually uh -huh. slip through. The first one of the other reflexes we'll demonstrate is the rooting reflex. So Carrie's just going to stroke right next to Millie's uh, mouth there. Um, and what you typically see in a newborn baby um, is that um, the baby will turn its head towards the side of the... Um, so um, Carrie will next check the grasp reflex, which does tend to extinguish by the time um, an infant is around Millie's age. Um, so around three or four months. It's a useful maneuver if you want um, to get the baby to open its fist up um, so that you can actually check this reflex is to kind of stroke along the side of the hand here. And we can actually demonstrate the plantar grasp reflex as well. An upgoing or extensor toe response can be normal um, in babies up to the age of about a year. Um, is we're going to demonstrate the moral um, reflex, which basically is where you um, close it. Um, the infant's arms will extend way out, um, sometimes out forward and sometimes out to the sides. Uh, that reflex typically extinguishes around three to six months of age. Um, and so it's important to check and make sure that that's um, symmetric. So next we wanted to demonstrate some physical exam findings that uh, you might want to elicit or observe in a two-year-old. Um, we thought we would start with kind of mental status or development, kind of normal um, interactions that a two-year-old would have. Um, so um, in general, for language development in a two-year-old, you would expect them to start saying two-word sentences and have up to 50 words, but this can be very variable, what you see in clinic. You can get a, kind of get a sense from the parents about uh, how they think that their language is developing. 50% of speech should be intelligible by an unrelated adult at this point. Uh, where's the giraffe's nose? Right there, where's his ears at? Right there. It's a pretty fun thing, huh? So here we can also use observation and toys to um, test things like fine motor and coordination. Um. All right, so here I'm going to draw a circle. Is this a circle? Can you draw a circle? So see, she draws a circle very nicely. She can mimic. Okay, I'm going to draw a straight line. See, it's a straight line. Can you draw a straight line? Good job. Can you show me your tongue? Uh, Good job. Can you close your mouth? Mm. Can you open it? Ah! Can you close your eyes real tight? Real tight! Good job! 
Can you jump? Great job. Jump one more time. Jump. All right. So for an almost five-year-old, the most of the things that you want to do on your neurologic exam are going to be the same as what you would do in an adult. Um, so we thought we could demonstrate some strength sure. testing. Okay. I got your Let's make some muscles up like this. Put your arms up way high like this. Put your elbows up. Put your elbows up. You keep them right there. Don't let me push them down. Don't let me push them down. Hard as you can. Good pizza box. You want to keep your hands real flat like this. And you don't want to drop that pizza, okay? You don't want to drop the pizza. Okay, close your eyes and keep holding that box straight up. Keep holding it right there. Keep holding it. So why don't you start over here and walk over and walk over to my friend Carrie over there on your tiptoes. Good job. Good job. Now vote. Can you walk back to me on your heels? Woo. Good job. Three, four. <laughs> <laughs> Extra tricky. Awesome. There we go. Oh, preschool oh, friends. I, have something like that. <laughs> I, I understand. हाँ देखो लोग अगर कोई क्वेश्चन आंसर है आवाज तो नहीं आ रही है क्वेश्चन आंसर है देखो कोई हैं इफ यू इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चन यू कैन ईमेल एस मी आई विल रिप्लाई इट इफ यू नीड सा एनी प्रेजेंटेशन यू जस्ट यू जस्ट सेंड मी आई विल सेंड यू द प्रेजेंटेशन एस वेल बिकॉज नाउ डेज यू आर एट द होम सो यू शुड एन clinical books these lectures and enjoy it thank you very much